Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the interviewing Wednesday. It's October 27th. We're here for session number 13 out of 13. Uh, for those people on Zoom, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just put them in the Zoom chat window. For those watching on Facebook, please just send your questions into the comment field. We are monitoring both feeds and we'll, we will be sure to get your questions answered for you. Please note this event is being recorded. It's currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, uh, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window do not appear in the recording. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in 2008, I started a website called careerdfw.org. We're coming up on our 13th birthday here next month. Uh, in 2012, I started a second website, careerusa.org, to help those who were unemployed around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search that you may not know. It is available on Amazon. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. The group's been around since the late 1990s. I took it over in 2007. And I'll tell you about our upcoming program. We have an uh, interesting program we have coming up this Friday at the end of the session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. And you'll hear more about that in just a moment. Well, uh, this 13 part series and, and uh, series that we played today is the fifth time that we will be concluding uh, running through all 13 episodes. Uh, Mark McDonald, who leads the practice interview team and Walt Glass, who runs the interview success workshop. I asked these gentlemen, uh, can you put together something to help us out? And since we weren't able to meet in person when COVID hit and they came up with 13 sessions, 20 hours of material. So uh, today we're on session number 13, all about uh, interview crashes or how to avoid interview crashes. So uh, this is a pre-recorded session. So uh, any questions that you put in the chat window, we will answer at the end of the session. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. And yeah, another uh, 13 sessions completed. This is the capstone, if I can use that word. So uh, if you've been with us for all 13 sessions, congratulations. And if you haven't, there's still time. You can go and watch them on YouTube. We'll talk more about that. I'm Mark McDonald. I've been leading the pit crew since early 2014, which, and that was just a few short months after I got laid off for the third time and the industry I worked in, which was the telecommunications equipment industry. So these are companies that made electronics for the phone companies like Verizon and AT&T to provide service to your homes and your business. And in 2002, they started having uh, tough times. And so between 2002 and 2012, I got laid off three times. So that is uh, was my part of my motivation to uh, join the pit crew and give back and help others. And then about a, after doing that for about a year, I assumed the leadership. And so I bring with that experience a lot of confidence that you too will land in, in uh, an equivalent or maybe even a better position than you had before. You know, based on the three layoffs I was involved in and all the other people who were laid off with me, they all managed to find their way back to gainful employment. And I believe you will too. And the best way for me to give back is to help you uh, uh, improve your interviewing skills. So here's how that works. Uh, we, I have a group of volunteers. Uh, there's about 30 of us on my mailing list. We've all, we all are or have been hiring managers and we all have been in job transition. And most of them, as a matter of fact, are currently in job transition. So they're volunteering their time to help you out. And so volunteering means practice interviews are completely free. There's no cost at all. And we give a very personalized and customized experience. You provide a job description that you'd like to practice against. And of course, you provide your resume as well. And then I organize a group, usually three uh, interviewers. We call them panelists. And we set up a time to meet. And we record it on Zoom. And so you get to see uh, afterwards yourself on Zoom how well you did. And of course, the interviewers prepare in advance as well. They ask you very good questions relative to your situation and your experience. And uh, we ask you a few tough questions too, or generally classified as tough questions. And then we also give you feedback. So you get feedback after you're done from hiring managers, people who have done this 
as part of their professional responsibility. And so that's how the pit crew works. Our motto is practice early, practice often. So that means you can, you don't have to have an opportunity in hand to come and practice. Just pick out a job description that looks good for you. Maybe it's a, your dream job and come and get some practice in. You know, the more you practice, the better you'll be. Just like the more you work on your resume and the more you work on your, link, your LinkedIn profile, you know, it continues to improve the same way with interviewing. Uh, you can and build your skills and you'd like to do that in anticipation of that key when that key interview arrives. So uh, just uh, pick out a job description and send it in to dallaspitcrew at gmail.com and we'll go to work setting up a practice interview for you. We can do them any day of the week now. So uh, because they're on Zoom, so let me know when you're available or if you're not, if there's certain times you're not available, plus two days and plus three days from when you send in your information, those would be business days. And that'll help me get started right away to set up your practice interview. Uh, there's my LinkedIn profile, and I'm also going to post it on the chat right now. So you can just click on that and go to my LinkedIn profile. If you do, if you would like to link in with me, please include a message that says we met on Interview Wednesday. And I just like to know where we made contact, and that's good enough for me. Add you to my network, and that'll help you when you're trying to find connections in your target companies. My network will be available to you. You'll be able to see it. So I also What's going to come up next? One-way interviews? Yes, one-way interviews. So besides the two-way interviews, which I just talked about, the pit crew also provides one-way interviews. And the pit crew offering is very simple. There's only four questions. It's primarily aimed at to give you an opportunity to become comfortable with this type of interviewing, because I got to say, it's very strange when you're doing a one-way interview and nobody's on the other end. Uh, you're just completely talking to a machine. And uh, so it's something I think you should practice. And I'll give you the questions in advance and a link to the tool. And then after that, you just interact with the tool. So you, uh, you'll, you'll, they'll present the questions to you. You can record your answer. You get three minutes for each. And then after you're done, you get another link that will take you to your video. Nobody ever sees any of that unless you decide to share that video link. Um, and pretty much after we get it started, I'm completely hands off with that. So that's the way it works. And I think Jeff and, and I, I know Jeff and Walt also have their versions of the one-way interview that may, that may be a little more in depth than what the practice interview team does. But as I mentioned, our goal is just to get you comfortable using the tool. And I think it's amazingly uncomfortable <laughs> the first time you do it. And then finally, I also coach. So besides helping people out by organizing their pit crew, I coach and I just coach on one question. You know, how do you answer the question, why did you leave your last position? Or sometimes interviewers may wanna know why you left several positions, you know, in, the, in your past. You know, they'll say, well, take me through your last four um, positions and why you left. So if that's gonna cause you some angst, anxiety, if you think you may, it makes you nervous to be able to answer that question then let's have a confidential discussion about your situation and we'll figure out how to tell your story with brevity and confidence and also how you might respond to any follow-up questions that arise from your situation so it's very much personalized to you it takes about an hour and just reach out to dallaspitcrew at gmail.com and we'll set up a phone call or a zoom call and uh, have a discussion about your situation good afternoon everyone what last year what do I do? It's a little bit differently than the pit crew, which I hardly recommend you do also. And that is, what are the fundamentals of interviewing? What are we selling and how do we sell them? The interviewing is a selling presentation. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that does a presentation without practicing it unless they have it not cold to begin with. They understand all the content, they know how to present, they understand their audience. They know how to do all those things from the get-go. They're already at that point. But most of us are not. Most of us, uh, we're not professional job seekers. We're not professional interviewers from the candidate's point of view. So how can we improve those skills and do that? So I'll offer the workshop. You have to be registered to attend. Look me up on LinkedIn. Look at my About section. It gives you some details there about what we do. So. Primarily, how do we differentiate ourselves from those other candidates? How can we be memorable from the other ones? 
for those of you that have hired people, you know what I'm talking about. When you come in on Monday and you've hired, uh, talked to four or five candidates last week, which one stands out? And why do you think they stand out? That's not an easy decision to make sometimes. Well, how can we help them make that decision quickly and easily? How can we see if there's a real match for us that that job fits us as well as it fits them? So we can do that. And the other thing is we're selling, I am, I do, and I help. We're selling our characteristics, who we are. What kind of personality do we have? What kind of soft skills do we have? And then we sell, I do, and that's the skills and knowledge we have, the hard skills, the activities that we do, the knowledge education that we've had in the past. And then the, I help, which is what can we do for them? So we want to take the characteristics and soft skills along with the actions and activities and skills and knowledge there to produce results for them. So how do we sell that? I see a lot of I do's in an interview. I do this kind of activity, do that kind of thing. I'm a project manager. I like project management. Yeah, you and all the rest of the project managers say the same thing. So how can we be different than that? Be glad to have you register. Sign up. Come on down. It's not where you have to sit in the hot seat. It's not stressful. You don't have to have a lot of anxiety. You will get an interview uh, video. I give you a handout which goes over many of the things that I talk about, plus some other things about uh, the handout itself that includes uh, around interviewing. So you get both of those and a couple other files that will help you. I do an analysis of your job description to help you tear down uh, what's the information is they're looking for in the job. So I can help you get started and also a list of things of things that you can prepare ahead of time prior to the interview so you can have some responses uh, pre-planned as to what they might be. So this will give you confidence so that you can go in with some enthusiasm, excitement, and interest in the job in the company, which is a huge differentiator. So sign up, send me that email, I'll give you some dates, come on down, I call it learning without squirming. This, uh, actually when I started, after I'd done the pit crew for about a year, I put together a presentation, lessons from the pit crew, and it was all about, you know, the mistakes that people make that are almost, that almost everybody makes. And uh, I gave that a couple of times. I gave that presentation a couple of times, and I said, well, this is not really what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about, all, you know, all the mistakes people make. I want to talk about, you know, how you do well. And so I changed the presentation, and uh, the common mistakes just became a couple of slides. And the rest of the presentation was about interviewing well, getting a good start, all the things we've talked about, you know, getting a good start, setting yourself apart, building rapport. And so this session, the last session of the 13, uh, really builds on everything we've taught before. And we're just going to look at the common mistakes that people make. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to avoid them. Once you're aware of them, we're going to look at them all at once, all at once in a group. And now at the end of this, you may be kind of overwhelmed. And so it's hard to characterize these things as mistakes. Some of them are definitely mistakes. Some of the things you want to avoid, you know, at all costs uh, could be very detrimental to your chances. But others are just best practices. So if you do these things instead of doing it some other way, you're going to have a much better chance of improving your your, your uh, candidacy of being selected as the final candidate. So uh, we'll try to identify some of those as we go along. Uh, I've reviewed the presentation you know, this week, getting prepared for this, and that's what I came away. I said, boy, there's a big, long list here. But yeah, there is a big, long list. Um, you're not going to be perfect on every one of them. And uh, we'll identify the ones that are you know, really, you know, to, really to avoid and the ones that are going to make a more positive difference in your experience. Here are the 13 sessions. And uh, if you're new or you've just you kind of came in in the middle, all of these available are available on the US Career USA YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, type in Career USA, all one word, no periods or anything, Career USA, and that'll take you to the Career USA YouTube channel where Jeff has a whole bunch of videos. One section is dedicated to interviewing and the, also all 13 of these are available in that section and there's some really good ones in here demonstrating enthusiasm and building rapport for example are really good ones the structure of this to help you with your search is that uh, the, the first five are all about preparing to interview 
Uh, the second five are all about effective interviewing. And then the last three that we've done and this one that we're doing today are some advanced topics that build upon the first 10. So you really wanna take a look at the first 10 before you delve into these uh, last three. Okay, I have a couple of big sections here and then uh, Walt will be giving his uh, perspective on avoiding an interview crash. Uh, I'm gonna go over a typical interview script. And so this highlights all the things we've talked about uh, in the first 12 sessions about how to interview effectively. And then we're gonna go through some mistakes that people make. And mostly these are uh, by frequency. So uh, I'll break them down into categories and we'll talk about the most common mistake that people make. And then, you know, the second and the third and the fourth and you'll get a perspective on that. Okay, so if you've been through the pit crew, here is a typical kind of uh, interview Wednesday pit crew um, recommendation. So number one, you do a lot of good preparation for the interview. And as I just showed you, there's five out of the 13 sessions are just about preparing to interview. So the way this works is you're, you'll see, I'll, let me do a couple more and then I'll, I'll show what that, why X means. Uh, you're going to greet the interviewer and then deliver your statement of enthusiasm. Okay, now that's my recommendation. Walt does it slightly differently, but uh, you know, the greeting and the statement of enthusiasm can be separate. I'm suggesting that the statement of enthusiasm be the greeting. So right away you start to talk about why you're enthused about that particular role. Okay. Then uh, you have an opening statement. You prepared an opening statement and you deliver that opening statement. Often the interviewer will say, tell me about yourself or what brings us together today or you know, why are you interested in this position? So that's your key to make your opening statement. And so you do that. And now let me tell you what the white X's mean. The white X's mean today we're gonna talk about this topic because this is a place where people make common mistakes. Okay, so we're going to focus in on those topics with a white X on them. Uh, number four, after you've made your opening statement, is you ask your first question. And these are questions des designed to get the interviewer to talk about what their most important priorities for this position are. Okay, and so you may uh, need to have a little deference to the interviewer because now you're going to start asking your own questions and they, they may not have actually had time to ask you one yet, um, except for, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, but it's very important that you do this right up front. And you'll notice as I go down here, there's some highlighted things in yellow. Every one of those is an opportunity for a question. And you should take opportunities to ask questions during your interview. And consider this when we, we have a whole session just on asking questions. And one of the, the things we ask the people who attend that interview, you know, do you believe that just answering the interviewer's questions is going to put you at the top of the list? And most people say, no, that's not, probably not gonna do it. And that's absolutely right. So just going in and answering questions and not asking any questions is a, not the fastest route to landing. And so it starts right at the beginning after your opening statement, you ask a question about the important priorities of this role you know, what, are, what characteristics do they need help? Where do they need help? So on and so forth, a whole list of things you could help. Now, uh, you're gonna be asked some behavioral interview questions. A behavioral interview question starts with, tell me about a time. Uh, tell me about a time where you had a difficult customer. How did you handle it? So that's a chance to tell a star story, a structured story with situation attacks a task, an action, and a result. A lot of people make mistakes uh, when they do this. And so this one gets three X's. Uh, we're going to talk about this one quite a bit. Uh, now you get a chance. Maybe you get asked a negatively oriented question. I, I see you don't have uh, this experience, or I see you don't have this degree, uh, or you know, tell me about a time where you made a mistake or the project you were working on didn't complete on time or 
you know, completely failed, so to speak. So you're going to get a chance to do that, and we're going to give you some feedback and reminder about how to do that well. A, good, a common question is, you know, don't you think you're overqualified or some sort of question that implies you're overqualified? So we're going to talk about how to handle that well. Uh, asking a question after a star story is a good opportunity to ask a question. So they ask you this question about a difficult customer, and then you may pop up a pop up question and say, "Well, when customers are unhappy with us, you know, what are they usually unhappy about?" That'd be a great thing to know because they just ask you, you know, how do you handle an unhappy customer? So uh, that's a good that's a best practice, right? Is to not for every question, you know, you can overuse these. But at the appropriate moment and something you're curious about, you know, pop up a question based on something they ask you. Answer the question, why did you leave your last job? And of course, that's something I coach on. And we have uh, half of a session dedicated just to answering this question. You're likely to get this question uh, early in the interview process, maybe not the first interview, but certainly uh, after that, people will be curious about why you left your last job or why you left several of your last jobs. So that's just the thing people are curious about. Uh, here's an opportunity now to ask a leading question. So you lead with what you'd like to hear a time about, but a time when I did something and then, you know, that's an achievement. You're trying to lead the interviewer to uh, let you tell a story that you want to tell, okay? Let you tell about a success that you want to talk about. And so that's a leading question. There's another way to work in a question and talk about yourself and your achievements and how you can help your new employer. Uh, you want to throw in some humor. Uh, you want to demonstrate your personality a little bit during the interview. I guess it's really a mistake to be completely stiff and formal. Uh, and so don't be afraid uh, to share some of your personality during the interview and uh, use a little humor. I mean, not now, not everybody's good at using humor, but uh, this is a good idea. You can make a positive quip or uh, to share a little bit about yourself when you're answering a question. Now, if you're in a panel interview, more than, more than two interviewers, then, uh, you know, or more than one interviewer, I mean, uh, you have to make sure you pay attention to all of the interviewers. And so this is something that we see people make a mistake of, focusing too much on one interviewer to the exclusion of the others. Um, Ask a question with the specific uh, purpose in mind of building rapport or building a connection with the interviewer. And so uh, expressing curiosity is a really endearing quality. So that specifically, this is what we suggest is you ask a question, I'm curious to know how, or I was wondering about, and get the perspective of the interviewer. So you'll gain information and they'll appreciate the opportunity to talk about their perspective or their thoughts on something that's interesting to you. And of course, what's gonna be interesting to you is something about how you can help them uh, and in their roles based on your previous experience. And it may even be something that uh, they haven't thought of, which would be really a home run. Compliment the interviewer. This is something that very few people do. And you know, is but if they say something insightful or you're starting to build this connection, this rapport, you know, you've got an opportunity to compliment them. Now, don't use this on panel interviews unless you are, you know, complimenting the entire panel, uh, but we'll talk about that too coming up. Bring your work product. This is a great thing to do. Bring some work product with you to show off at the appropriate time. And um, anybody, even on the video interviews, you know, you, you don't, you can't hand it to them, but you can show them. You can say, you know, at the beginning of the interview, I have the job description, I have the resume, resume I have my list of questions I'd like to ask. And oh, by the way, I brought some work product. This is a data sheet that I did. And if we get a chance, I'd like to share it with you or talk about how I did that. So there you go. Now you've got some work product. Work products really, you know, you're an expert in what you did. And uh, if you're, you know, 
it gives you a chance to be proud of something you've done in the past that's applicable to what they need. So that's a good practice as well. Answer the question, what are your salary requirements? We have another, we have a half a session just on this as well. The same one we talk about, why did you leave your last job? We also talk about how to answer this question. What are your salary requirements? So this is not gonna be uh, something that we give much feedback on today, but it is part of the list of you know, preparing for and delivering a good interview. And then your la almost last opportunity to ask a question is your end of the interview question. So you prepare these in advance. Some of them may get asked during the process of the interview. If you get a chance to drop them in, but certainly you'll have some at the end. What are the next steps? and asking for some feedback uh, at the end. How do I match with your ideal candidate? So that's, a, and we'll give you some feedback on mistakes that people make in this regard. And then finally, a big one, ask to be advanced to the next step, ask for the job, make a good closing statement. So uh, mistakes are made in this area as well. So that's kind of the script for a successful interview using all the parts and pieces and techniques that uh, we teach in this 13 session series. Common interview preparation mistakes. So number one, not focusing enough on the company's missions, values, goals, and customer experience. In general, you need to spend time figuring out you know, what's important to the company and their missions, values, and goals. And if they, if they have a retail presence, you, know, you can go to their store or their office or visit their website and find out what that experience is about, okay? Also, not very many people or not enough people, I would say, who come through the Fit Crew have attempted uh, to seek out information from former employees or current employees. Okay, so uh, you can locate former employees on LinkedIn and you can try to network into them and just ask them questions, give you some inside information and some insight about the culture and the organization, maybe the challenges they face. It's a great opportunity for extra preparation. It's a, be it's a best practice, I would say, to take this step and um, it'll inform your interviewing and give you a much better chance of being the final selection if you do this. Now, if you haven't done this for the initial interview and you get called back for a second and third interview, you know, the, the urgency to get this done ramps up, but now there's some time pressure. So this is kind of all built around target companies and preparing in advance and uh, finding a job instead of being found, you know, instead of just sitting at home and waiting for someone to call you with an opportunity that looks good to you, you know, turn that completely on its head and start the search for companies that you know or you suspect, and then you verify through informational interviews so you know that they would be interested in you, they have opportunities that you would be interested in and a culture that excites you as well. That's a much better approach than the random walk of waiting for a job to open and a, company, and a good company and you being the perfect candidate for the job. So session 11, which we just did a couple of weeks ago, is all about uh, informational interviews and target companies. And um, go take a look at that session if you'd like some more information. Now, also, people don't analyze the job description, I would say. In general, uh, when they come to the pit crew, uh, you know, we we prepare, sometimes we prepare much more than the candidate appears to have prepared specifically for the job description. And so there's a whole session, I think it's session five. Yes, analyzing the job description is session five. Uh, so spend some time with that job description, uh, but just realize that it may not, it may not be current and it may not be all of the uh, job requirements. And so Part of the best practices is very early in the interview, as a matter of fact, right after you've had a chance to make your opening statement, you're going to start asking questions to find out if there's any additional requirements or things that are not on the job description or 
a different perspective from the person in front of you about what's needed for this role. And I think a lot of times you're gonna find out there is, uh, but having a good understanding of what's written down in the job description is a good start and spend some time on that. And you can even uh, do your own verification before the interview starts by reaching out to people who have the same title or who had the same title, who used to work at the company and had the same title, you can call them up and say, well, you know, once you've made a little contact and asked them for some help and they've agreed, you know, what, what is, you know, what is actually required to do this job? You know, what are the challenges that this position faces? What kind of skills um, would uh, make a good, uh, a productive and successful, you know, employee for this role? And so you can pick up that information in advance uh, by finding people who have, who've had the similar job in the past, uh, who work at a company or, or don't work at the company, used to work at the company. So opportunities missed, uh, when you don't do that kind of outreach, uh, networking, I would call it. Okay. Opening statement mistakes. So. Number one is an unstructured response. I would say most of the people who come to the pit crew are don't, don't really have a good idea how they're gonna answer this question, okay? Let's say 80%. And so what, what happens is they, they kind of go hunting and fishing or shot, shotgunning it. They talk about all the things they've done. They Sometimes they review their resume. Uh, there's no particular message. There's no particular uh, specific ways they could help or uh, achievements that are going to resonate with the uh, hiring manager. It, it, you know, it's, it's just a summary. It's just a summary. And so the best way to do that is to have a structured statement, you know, talk about your motivation, talk about some achievements. You don't have to talk about how you did them. You just need to mention the achievements. You're planting some seeds to let the hiring manager or the interviewer, if it's not the hiring manager, know that you have some idea about what this role is about, maybe based on the job description, it may also be based on the research that you've done, and you have some idea how you can help them. And uh, so those, those are kind of the two areas that you need to cover, your motivation and the ways you can help. And you may also, you know, depending on your situation, talk a little bit about your professional training and a little bit about yourself. And uh, there's a whole session on session six, openings and closings, where we talk about how to do this well. The main takeaway, I think, is have some structure, have some purpose in that opening statement. Don't just wing it. Don't just talk about uh, your resume. Don't just talk about what you do. Talk about how you can help and why you're motivated to help this company at this time in this role. So that's the best practice. I just mentioned this, you, even if they ask to review your resume, you don't wanna review your resume first. You wanna make your opening statement, which by the way, needs to be relatively short, two minutes um, would be good. And so it's not gonna take a lot of time to show that you're focused, you have purpose, you have an idea how you can help, you have some motivation to help. And then you might say, where would you like to start? Um, or you might even offer a question, would you like to hear about a time where I did something X, Y, and Z? If they really wanna review your resume, uh, then that would be the time to do it. And then of course you gotta work in your first questions, right? What are their top priorities? So you know uh, if the job description is accurate, or if there's additional things that haven't been added to, that you know are important that aren't on the job description. Okay, yeah, the third bullet up here, not immediately transitioning to your first question after the opening statement. This is this is really important, and um, we, when we talk about difficult questions, which we did last week, a lot of difficult questions you might receive like uh, specifically questions about your background or things that are missing in your background or your lack of experience in a certain area can be addressed by knowing what their most important priorities are, okay? And so you can deflect those questions by talking about how you meet 
those important criteria is what they just told you, you know, a few minutes before, uh, as opposed to not having something that was on the job description. Um, and if they, you know, if they still, you know, uh, pursue it, you know, you, if you're open to say, well, uh, is this one of the most important things in, in, uh, uh, that you need done for this job? You know, not having a, degree, a CPA degree or whatever the, the shortage may be. So it's, it's, it's got a lot of benefits uh, in the interview when you come across some difficult questions, if you know and, and what their most important priorities are and you've asked every interviewer that question, okay? Because you may get a slightly different or even a dramatically different perspective from different functional people who are uh, asking you questions. And there's some examples you might add, uh, questions you might ask. What are the characteristics of top performers in this role? Uh, for this role, what are your most important priorities? Or, you know, just a very straightforward question. Where do you need me to help? Uh, a little bit later in the interview, I'd, I recommend asking this question, you know, based on my background, after you've had a chance to discuss a little bit based on my background, where do you see me, me making the biggest impact? Which is, I think is a very good open-ended question. They can answer that question in several different ways. Uh, and it's good information for you to know as well. Now, some interviewers do not give you a chance to make an opening statement. And so not recognizing or taking the opportunity to make an opening statement uh, is a mistake. And the statistics say about two thirds of the time, maybe three quarters of the time, the interviewer is gonna ask you to tell me about yourself. But as a matter of fact, if you go take a, a jo your job uh, title, you know, if you go and Google questions, you might be asking an interview for project manager or for accountant or for a customer uh, specialist. Uh, you're gonna say the first question is tell me about yourself, okay? Tell me about yourself. So it's very common, but it's not 100%, okay? It's not 100%. And sometimes for second interviews or third interviews with a, you know, when a uh, second round or third round interviews, when somebody comes back to practice, we'll on purpose skip asking that question to see if the candidate, you know, after having, you know, practiced before, will go ahead and present their opening statement, even if they're not giving an opportunity to. So, this is something you need to be aware of as well. Not everybody's going to give you a chance. You should take the chance or you should take the opportunity or make the opportunity. It's only a couple of minutes long. It's going to be very focused about your motivation and the way you can help. You need to work that in at the beginning. Don't, don't go deeper into the interview without. Now, let's say that if this just doesn't work out, and so what you want to do is if you don't get the chance to make that opening statement as you kind of sprinkle in the achievements and perhaps your, your some comments about your motivation without them having to ask. So if you get an opportunity, you can say, would you like to hear a story about and talk about an achievement? Or, you know, one of the things I want to make sure you're aware of is that I'm, I'm really motivated to have this job and work at this company because just tell them. And uh, so that, that covers making the opening statement, even if you don't get to make it in the first few minutes. Yeah, here you go. The offer may not, it may not be obvious that they ask you to make an opening statement and it may not even be intended. Okay, they, they may just be you know, skipping that step. It's not part of their uh, interview ritual, but uh, make the opportunity, take the opportunity to make that opening statement. Hmm. Change. Okay, yeah, the fifth, I got a lot of these <laughs> opening statement mistakes. Too much focus on what you do versus how you help. And so these are Walt's words, you know, I do and I help. Uh, in the opening statement, it needs to be really focused on achievements and how you help. The chance to talk about how you did it and your, your personality, who you are, will come up later, but in the opening statement, you're planting these seeds. I can help you talk about how you can help, okay? And so the recommendation is that you don't talk at all about how you did it, uh, just how you can help, what the result was of, 
uh, some activity. Okay, star story mistakes. Uh, star stories are really powerful. Uh, they get, uh, you can, they can use them to build an emotional connection with the interviewer. Uh, and of course, the star stories uh, end well. So uh, there's a powerful result at the end. Uh, but people tend to make some mistakes uh, based on a kind of a misconception, I think, or a misunderstanding of what the objective is. And I'll tell you the bottom line. The bottom line is to get the result, get to the result within 90 seconds. And so <clears throat> sometimes people will jump the gun on the star story. They won't listen to it all the way. They think they know the answer and they'll start to speak too quick. What's, what's going to cover this? In general, as an issue with answering any kind of question, not just star stories, um, making the star story too long is the primary thing that people uh, do. Now, some people can make it too short, they're too terse, they don't provide enough information. Uh, and so that's a mistake as well. But by and large, you know, almost everyone, nine out of 10 candidates at the pit crew, we give them fed feedback to be more brief. And so the real trouble with that is um the situation and the action part of a star story so a situation task action result and so a lot of times people want to cover the situation in quite a bit of depth i was one of those people as well before i learned this because my perspective was if you don't understand how difficult the situation is you're not going to really be able to understand how great what i did was uh, but that's what's covered in the result right so you don't need to spend a lot of time on the situation. As a matter of fact, it can be very brief, uh, just placing it in a context of where you work, where, you know, what your role was at the time, what level, for instance, you were in the company. Also, the action, uh, the action can be very detailed. I mean, there may be a lot of things you did, okay, and you would want to talk about all of them, but you need to also shorten the action part to so if you have five things that you did and you want to talk about all of them, just say, well, I'm just going to share with you the two most important things out of the five things that were key to this result that I got, which, you know, then you're going to talk about the result. And if the interviewer is curious about what the other three things were, they will ask. And then you get, you know, you get another 90 seconds to provide additional information. But if they're not, you know, they may be impressed with the result, but it's not, you know, top of their mind and you haven't used up time talking about things that they're not particularly interested in. So um, star stories, I've got a whole session on star stories, session three, and um, just don't fall in that trap of uh, talking too much, talking too much about things that may not be important and uh, certainly spending too much time on the situation. It can, be, it can just be very brief. And uh, so, and what oftentimes happens when people spend too much time on the situation, too much time on the action, they forget to say the result. They forget the money line. And uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, the goal is to get the result in 90 seconds. That's what needs to be in your mind when you're preparing in advance. And by the way, I encourage you to practice telling your star stories. You can record themselves. You can uh, start a Zoom session and, uh, you know, record your video of yourself telling the story. Uh, you need to kind of develop some muscle memory in your tongue so that the words you want to say come out and the other things that are floating around in your head don't, okay? Some people get distracted by telling the story and what's happened in the flow of the interview. So you want to practice these things to, some, to the extent that you are confident you can deliver them and if you choose to add or subtract information based on timing or the reaction of the interviewer you can do that as well you can be extemporaneous uh, but getting them brief is going to take some practice okay because most people tend to start start drifting i call it drifting in uh, their focus on answering the question and getting to the result and so practice 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 of course you can come to the pit crew and practice answering those questions as well but Practice answering them at home with your phone or uh, with a video recorder. And just, uh, we say this all the time in the pit crew, brevity is better. So if you can answer, if you can give a star story, you know, the situation, task, action, and result in less than 90 seconds, go ahead. 
go ahead and give it in less than 90 seconds. Brevity is valued uh, by hiring managers. Okay, this is a big one. And a lot of people have been worked in teams and been trained that there's no I in team. Okay, so they'll tell their star stories using the third person. And that's a mistake. Uh, the, the task can be a team task. The action needs to be what you did. Okay. Uh, it needs to be your part. What I did was, or my part was, and then the result might be a team result. So most of the star story can be team oriented, but the action has to be about you. They're not <laughs> hiring the team. They're hiring you. So they want to know what you did and how you reacted and how you addressed your part. And uh, so don't use we more, you know, when you're, especially when you're talking about the action part. Okay, yeah, talk, talking in generalities. Um, some people believe, uh, some people and some uh, personalities. So we had a, we interviewed a learning and development specialist uh, last week and she just really couldn't help but teach. I mean, all of her answers were aimed at teaching and to, you know, to the extent she'd tell us what she was gonna tell us and then she would tell us and then she would tell us what she told us. <clears throat> uh, and it was all very bookish, okay? But what people are mostly want to hear is about what you did, how you addressed it, and not how you might do it if you were, uh, you know, reading it in a book, how it might be taught to you or explained to you. They want a very specific instance, your instance, okay? So tell me about a time where you had a difficult customer. So instead of talking about how you handle a difficult customer in general, You'd say, well, if the customer was upset about this, I would do that or this or the other thing. They want to hear a very specific story, an example of how you uh, handled a difficult customer. And so you're going to include details that only you would know that apply to the story that you're telling. So those, uh, and that's its own trap right there, okay? Because you can, you can be too detailed or too specific. So you have to decide, and this is why you practice in advance, you know, which details are important to the story and use those details, not all the details, not every uh, little nuance uh, needs to be included, but enough needs to be included to build your credibility. And that's how you do it. You talk about things that are very specific, uh, have numbers, you know, dollars are good, dollars are the best. You can talk about dollars, but transactions are just numbers and transaction events or percentage improvement. Or if you're just telling a one-on-one -on -one story about a customer, you know, you can be very specific about what they were upset about because you know, right? Because you ask those questions and that'll help build credibility. Uh, one a caution about percentage, you know, some people say things were improved 50%. Well, that, <clears throat> that's not very helpful unless it's put into context. So things were, you know, it's a lot different improving things by 50% if it's, you know, two to three, then if it's 200 to 300, right? So there you're back to providing a number to put that percentage in context, okay? And that, that would tell them what the scope and span of your achievement was. Okay, common panel interview mistakes is focusing too much time on the panelist to ask the question. And so this is very difficult to do in a, video interview um, because there's really only one person there to the camera. Uh, but when you're meeting face to face, you want to continue to, to talk to everybody who's in front of you. So spend a little bit of time, a couple of sentences for each person and just go around the room as you answer the question. This also gives you a chance to see what their reaction is to check their uh, body language or their facial expressions uh, to see if you're landing or not. And so that's a, that's a common mistake when we used to meet face-to-face -face, that people would tend to spend too much time addressing the person who asked the question and not with the other members of the interview panel.
Uh, I put a comment down below that uh, the same way with asking some of these personalized questions until you it's kind of sorted out what each person's role and responsibility is. You want to just ask uh, questions that are that anyone could respond to, not aimed at any particular person. And then you'll learn by the questions that you ask you know, what their particular focus is. Also, complimenting a single panelist is a bit of a mistake, and um, a lot of people use this phrase, maybe it's a, it's a crutch phase, you know, that's a great question, um, but it's a common way to slide all the other panelists who haven't yet asked their great question, okay? And so singling them out for praise and uh, not praising the other two. It's kind of like complimenting one without complimenting the other two. So um, don't use that, don't do that. Um, you might say, and instead of saying that's a great question or you might say, well, I'm, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. It's something I wanted to address and then you know, go into it. Okay, taking the lead. Let's talk about this for a moment. And I think I'm getting pretty close to my part, end of my part. This is a quote from Jack Bick. Jack Bick's a coach with the Pit Crew and Career Alliance. He's written a couple of books and uh, he volunteers his time with the Pit Crew. And he said this one time, I thought it was a great line. The middle of the interview is a conversation created by you. Okay, so you guys may recognize that getting into a conversation or a dialogue with the interviewer is a good idea. It gives them a chance to talk. It gives you a chance to get additional insight, uh, to learn about the role, to build a connection with them. But it's not likely to happen unless you make it happen by asking questions. Okay, it's going to be they ask you answer. It's going to be an interrogation. It's going to be no different than anyone else who allows themselves to be interrogated. And so you have to take the lead. And that's why the title in this slide is taking the lead. This is going to separate you from the pack is starting a conversation by asking questions. So how do you do this well? Okay, you have a list of pre-prepared questions that you want to ask, and certainly those ones right at the beginning, you're going to get started right after your uh, opening statement to start asking questions to get them to tell you and show your, you know, interest, your persistence and interest, your goal to figure out what they need help with and, you know, how you can provide that help. Okay, so that's your pre-prepared questions, and of course, those questions you ask at the end of the interview as well. You know, what are the next steps? Uh, how do you see me fitting in? Um, are good questions. So you make that list of questions and, uh, but that doesn't, that's not the middle. That's just the beginning and the end. Okay. Pop-up questions I already gave you kind of an example of a pop-up question. So they ask a question and then that uh, ignites a thought or curiosity or an interest in you. And so you ask a question back, okay. This is a very good way to get them to start talking and for you to gain information and also to start to make a connection because uh, you'll start, if your thinking is aligned and that's kind of the definition of rapport, you begin to understand that you think that each of, each of you think alike, you have this kind of thing in common, then through asking questions, you can discover that. And then uh, what about questions are used to influence the course of the interview and that may not be, you know, what about is kind of a general word. I mean, have you ever thought about doing X, Y, and Z? And uh, it's, it's a way to solicit a response for them, but also to get a boomerang, right? So they may say, hmm, I never thought about it, but tell me more, you know, what do you think about it? I'll just boomerang that question back to you. So if it's something that isn't on the job description, but you know might be helpful, you suspect highly it might be helpful, this is a great time to say, well, what about, you know, have you ever thought about using uh, agile uh, project management techniques to improve financial forecasting or improve sales forecasting? So uh, this would be kind of a non-standard uh, concept of, for using agile techniques, which are mainly, mainly used for software development. Maybe you've done that. I've seen some pretty interesting things done like this. And so you could just ask this question and see if they've ever thought about it because you have experience with it. You know it works. You could implement it in their um, company. And, you know, it may be a differentiator. It may turn out to be a differentiator for you. 
Now, any of these types of questions can be personalized. So you can ask the question generically, what do you think about? Or you might say that uh, that's, that's more of a personalized question. You, know, you might say, I was wondering if you've ever done X, Y, or Z. Uh, or you can say, I was, I was wondering what your opinion is or how do you feel about? Uh, so that's a more personalized approach. And when we talk about asking questions in uh, session six, nope, not a, in session eight, I'm sorry, asking questions in session eight, we talk about how you personalize the questions. And so that's a, that's a best practice as well. I agree with everything Mark said. So let me just go over a couple of things. In general, in the past uh, sessions, kind of Mark has put together his stuff and I've put together my stuff. Uh, gives you kind of two opinions, and a lot of it overlaps, a huge amount really overlaps. So on this one, and what I did, I said, gee, everything he said, there's no need for me to repeat a lot of the things that I think are critical and important. So I, I, I tried to remove a lot of the overlap that would come from what I would say and what he would say. So <clears throat> by the fact that I don't say everything he said does not mean I hardly support his stuff because I do. So that's that's good stuff. So and before I show the first slide that I have, I, here's the nutshell of avoiding crashes. Uh, there's two ways I can say it. One is you didn't do things in lessons one through 10, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's kind of a really large amount of stuff, but what are the, what are the ones that might, may be the most critical in impact? And so what I would come down to uh, a phrase or something, I think, you know, like this, if we don't really have the right mindset going into the interview, we don't practice brevity, conciseness, and we don't give clear, relevant responses in their frame of reference, we're headed down the wrong path. So it's your mindset that makes a big change. And if you have the right mindset, and that gets me into the first slide, That'll help us do a much better job of presenting ourselves and differentiating ourselves with other candidates. So I just picked out some a few of them. And so let's talk about negative questions for a moment, because generally they're kind of scary to answer and it causes a little bit of anxiety about how we handle them. So uh, one response that I get is I can't think of anything. Well, you're not you're going to get blown away with that one because there's got to be something negative in your background and experience. All right. So that one doesn't get us very far at all. And if we're too brief and terse, now there's a part of brevity that I think is a paying attention to, and I'll get into that in a second. But we can't just say something negative and just leave it there. And then there's a problem with people telling too much information about the negative, okay? And then uh, we might select something that has a negative impact on the business. Right, one guy said he accidentally hit the emergency shutoff button on the wall in the data center and shut down the data center. Okay, I wouldn't choose that as an example. I mean, it's a great example of the greatest failure, but it won't get you hired either. So we don't have to pick that one. We want to pick something a little bit easier on impact of the business and failing to then comment on what was the learning or how we manage something. It's a weakness that resulted from that mistake. Because the real question and the motive behind the question is, do you recognize your mistakes? And what did you do about them? What did you learn from? Them? So how to do it well? <clears throat> we can ignore things like, tell me some recent mistakes. We can ignore recent and we can ignore plural. But so we select a net, doesn't have to be recent. Nets are defined by something that doesn't have a big business impact. It has a little business impact. Whatever the negative is, use just a few words. You can tell the truth, but not the whole truth, the god awful truth in some cases. And then positively, so that mindset goes to what did I learn or how do I manage or develop you know, a weakness? So I could give you an example. I used this one before, you may have heard it. I often forget to use my coupons at the grocery store. So what I do is I'll put them in the glove compartment on the car and they're always available every time I go to the store and I stop, okay? So here's, what I, here's the mistake, here's what I learned, here's what I do so that I don't make that mistake again. Now the God awful truth is I forget to take them out of the glove compartment 
when I take them into the store, I forget to give them to the cashier. And then when I get back in the car and I look at them, they're expired anyway. So that's a true story. <laughs> and that happens to me. And I still have problems with the dadgum coupons, okay? But I don't want to, uh, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm an open truth teller, I'm going to just open my kimono and just show all the bad stuff, all right? Well, those of us that want to do that are not going to be successful in getting a job. So we can tell the truth. One person was asked, tell me about some of your recent mistakes. I said, okay, one was this, another one was this, and another was this. And I said, stop. He said, well, I'm answering the question. I said, great. You answered the question that way and you won't get the job. So which way do you want to go? So you've got some options here as to how to do that. So how to handle these negative questions or in this how to do this well. So speak with positivity. My expertise in this area is growing as I learn more and more. Okay, working knowledge, I'm able to learn quickly. I have expertise in a similar area. Maybe their CRM system is different than the one you're used to, but I'm very familiar with this and I can easily pick up, and I have the expertise that I can easily pick up the new system to, to learn the inputs, outputs, et cetera, and how to navigate the system, something like that, all right? Now, if they get to a biggest negative, the greatest failure, okay? What was your biggest mistake you ever made or something like that? Uh, here's my suggestion on answering that. Remember, that it doesn't have to have a big business impact to be a big mistake or a big failure. The difference between a mistake and a big failure is basically the significance in the learning. A big mistake, a big failure says, I learned something very significant. I, I, it changed my way. I, I do things differently from my own because of that. So let's again, we don't have to pick one like we shut down the data center. We can just pick something that was significant. And I, and I told one like this, it said, well, I read the one minute manager uh, by Ken Blanchard years ago and, and, and he said, catch somebody doing something right. And it changed my leadership style from that day forward. And even in my personal life with my family and my children, all right? I, I came home that day and I caught my children doing something right and it blew their minds away. They couldn't believe it, it was me talking to them. You know, what happened? Because I said, ah, oh, I saw what you were doing. We didn't do anything, Dad. We didn't do anything. So yes, you were. You were sitting there playing together, having a good time, and enjoying one another company, you know? And they were like amazed because I would say something like that to them instead of saying, whose socks are these on the floor? Come in here and pick these things up. So I changed that approach. And that works also well in, in the company. So now when I recognize somebody, uh, I would recognize them individually first, if they get a bonus, I give them the pocket, they have the money in the pocket first, then I recognize them publicly. So that kind of thing changed my life. So that's just an example of that. Overqualified, now several of us fit in this overqualified question and many I hear are very- uh, So Walt, yes. excuse me. When, you are, when they ask something about biggest failure and I like the way you said frame it and it doesn't have to be you shut out the data center. But can you bring something that's a profound learning from your personal life and uh, say that you've learned to treat people differently or better or be more open and tolerant or things like that? Are they uh, suitable in uh, a professional interview session? I suggest start with professional. All right, always go with a professional answer before a personal answer. Now, if they ask you a personal question to say it's something in your personal okay. life, uh, I, I might address it that way. You have to be careful because they ask a legal question sometimes. If they ask an illegal question about your personal life, you give them a very short answer. You might you know, inquire as to why is that question interesting to them? You know, what? why would they ask that question? And then after you're hired, you can correct them. <laughs> so, but I would stay, I would stay professional, my suggestion. Relevant, relevant to the job. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, and you know it would be professional relevance to the job, but you know you you start understanding better. You know you start developing empathy for other people or things like that that may right. come in handy. But agreed, agreed. Well, when I first became a team leader, and towards my last position in a leadership role. <laughs> What leadership do you think I knew in being a team leader compared to what I had 20 years later? Uh, quite, a, quite a difference. So I might pick something out. So when I first became a team leader, you know, I thought I understood my people. 
I quickly found out that I didn't. I interviewed each one so that I could really apply their knowledge, skills, and resources to make us more effective in, in our results and our activities, as an example. Thank okay, you. overqualified. Uh, here's what I hear a lot in interviews. The first thing I generally hear quite often is, no, I don't think so. Don't you think you're overqualified? No, I don't think so. And I hear I'm absolutely qualified. Well, absolutely, Abby uh, suggests that we tell that one. Uh, with all my experience, look at what value I bring to the position. I can hit the ground running. Yeah, okay. No, you, you, you maybe not think you're overqualified, yet you're right qualified on that. Yeah, you feel like you are. I can bring greater value to the position. Yes, I can hit the ground running. I can mentor and coach others to develop. Yeah, you can do that, okay? Some of us say, well, there's some additional, you know, I don't know everything. There's some additional learning opportunities. And then they sell the difference in the fact that I haven't worked in this industry before, which gives me a good reason not to hire you because you don't have experience in this industry. And my experience will be an asset to the company will help me be, you know, do well in this position. And you're right. That's all. You're right. Okay. But my question to you is, have we answered the motive to the question? There's a motive for asking this question. What have we done? Well, first of all, we told them they're wrong. We said, no, I'm not overqualified. Well, they think we are, right? And then we give them all the reasons to show them that we are overqualified. So that technique doesn't work very well. So I suggest first we target right. What position are you targeting? Are you willing to take a lower level position? Maybe you are, maybe you've reached a point in time. I did that in my last job. I, I went from a, a, a significant leadership role to an individual contributor role as a customer success, customer relationship manager dealing with colleges and universities in the state of Texas. So I had, it was like a stepping down position from the things that I used to do. So they'll ask questions, overqualified, lower level, something like that. So they believe we're overqualified. It doesn't matter whether we are or not, they believe we are because they asked the question. The motives, there's several things that can come up in the motive. This question has probably more motives, potential motives than any other question. Uh, we're old in our set in our ways, all right? We, we, it's gonna be a lower salary. Uh, we can't adapt to change too much. We, we can't keep up with the things that are going on in the world. And I, you know, and you, and you look back at all the changes you've been through in your career and you're saying, you don't think I can keep up with changes? How do you think I survived over the last 15, 20 years in my role? Lack of interest in long-term employment. Oh, you're just gonna work for a couple of years and then retire and you're gonna quit. You're just looking to finish out your career, which may be true. Some of us are saying, I just wanna work for three or four more years and that's it. Uh, and the main concern, being the, the biggest one, is a short time. You won't be happy here, you won't like it, and you'll leave. And I don't want to invest all that time in you and money in you to bring you on board, get you acclimated, get you going, get you started, and then turn around and leave. So here's a suggestion how we might approach it. Let's agree with the interviewer. Well, if you say that I'm overqualified, would you agree that I'm qualified? Well, of course you are, and they're going to agree with that. And that's a little bit of a sales technique to start them to move from a negative situation in their mind to a positive situation in their mind. As we are in a selling presentation, we need to learn how to sell ourselves, right? So <clears throat> let's talk about things that says, this is the job for me and why, and this is the place where I wanna do it and why. In other words, convince me that this is the job you want to do and that you want to do it here. Now, in my opening statement, this is a couple of things that I include in my outline for your opening statement to tell them why you love this type of job, doing these type of activities, producing these kinds of results, and why this particular company, their services, their products, the industry, whatever it might be, that says these things energize me to work in this position in this company, right? So I actually say uh, that's a couple of things you can put in your opening statement to already show that you're interested in that job, no matter what your background or responsibilities might have been. Uh, 
I also suggest we go to the motive itself, to the most general, most often used motive of why asking this question. And we close it, we, we, kill, we go directly to the motives. I never take a position where I'm not fully committed. That tells people that I'm not a short timer. This is the thing I want to do. I'm 100% in on this. I won't be leaving soon. And if other motives are revealed, if they come back and say, well, I'm concerned about salary or something like that, but then you're going to have to address those. Are you willing to take a lower pay? Have you, have you had experience working with a younger boss? Have you shown your adaptability to change and your flexibility to move forward? And you probably have some stories where you can talk about those kinds of experience and how you handle those and show that it was not an issue or a problem. Closing is a big one. So I brought this one in. The biggest mistake I see is no close at all. Zero close, nothing. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, I cringe when I hear those words. Uh, I'm sure that a car salesman will come up to me and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to show you these vehicles today. Uh, thanks for, for coming in and uh, talking to me and finding out some information. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you soon. Here's my card and you walk out. No, car salesmen don't do that. No salesperson does that. But we do as candidates, we do it often. We don't close a sale. If we all agree we're in a selling situation, then we ought to have a close. Not summarizing your interest in the value that you bring. So in a close, it's like, well, you've selected this automobile. You like the color, you like the engine, you like the interior, okay? You like the seats, uh, you like the sound of the radio, so, you know, all that stuff. All the reasons somebody would like to buy, you know, that you found out during the sales process, which is why we ask those questions in the beginning. What are you buying? Who are you buying? How do you define success in this role? What are the characteristics of the person to be successful in this role? What are the most important ones? Because then we can sell to those things. That's why asking that question is so important that Mark emphasized after your opening statement. So we also don't request feedback. We're, we're afraid to ask for feedback. Uh, many reasons for this, uh, fear of rejection. Uh, I don't wanna put my interviewer on the spot. I don't wanna put any pressure on them. Uh, I'm just, I just want to leave it alone. I'm, I'm afraid to ask it. And then we don't take charge of our job search. It's called the uh, interview and hope method. I'll come in, interview, answer questions, and hope that you call me. And many of us saying, I hear crickets too often. I don't hear anybody calling me back. I don't know how long to wait before I call them back. So how do we do these things well? Well, let's show interest in the job. So here's kind of an outline I have for a summer, you know, in closing. So well, everything we've talked about today looks great. I can't wait to get started. I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, some people might say, uh, gee, where would I be sitting if you hired me? Uh, something like that. A little humor inside of that. Summarize the value we, we bring. Let's tell them why they should hire us. We're going to answer that question in a quick, brief summary all in about 90 seconds now, the value. I mean, not 90 seconds for number two. I mean, the whole close runs about 90 seconds. So summarize the value. We've talked today about you need a person who can help you uh, turn customers around, achieve higher profit margins, develop new products, whatever their needs are, that I can help you do this, okay? Seeking feedback. How do I compare to the ideal candidate? Do you see me fitting into this role? ask for feedback. You may not get an answer. Most of the time interviews are, they don't have to tell us anything and we have to tell them everything, right? It's kind of unfair. But you can watch body language. It's not gonna hurt you to ask the question. Think about it from the interviewer's perspective. I mentioned that earlier in your answers uh, from the interviewer's perspective. If you ask them, it says, I'm really curious to know how I, you would compare me to the ideal candidate. It's a positive way of saying, do you have any concerns about me fulfilling this role? Please don't ask, do, I have, do, I have, do my qualifications fit the job? I'm gonna tell you why. First reason is, yes, they do, but that doesn't mean you're gonna get hired, all right? Qualifications are not the only thing that makes the hiring decision. It's your personality, it's your culture fit. 
It's your soft skills. It's how you communicate and how you talk. It's not so much the star story you tell. It's more powerful and how you tell it. I remember in the pit crew, question was asked for a star story and the person laughed. He said, that was a fun one. And then he told the story showing how much fun he had going through that process to achieve specific results. And all the panel members says that was one of the best things that the person did was how they told that story and laughing and saying that was a fun one, that he enjoyed doing that. Always figure out, find out what their process is for hiring. Update it as you go along. Who will I be interviewing with? What are their names? What are their roles? Get as much information as you can. Uh, there's some information about in other sessions about uh, being careful about some things because recruiters don't like to give away too much information. They're afraid you're going to go around them. So you can say, I'm just looking for information so I can do some research. I promise you that I won't go around you. I will go through you with the communications of anything I need to allay that concern. But always find out what's the update. Who's the hiring manager? Who makes the hiring decision? Could be HR. When's the projected start date? When's your decision date? Who will I hear back from as a result of this meeting? When should I hear back from them? All right, those are the questions that you ask because why? You wanna know everything you can know about the next steps. When's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, whatever. Then you know when to contact them. When should I hear back from somebody? Okay, well, Jeff, you said I'll hear back from you and when should I hear back from you? All right, so it's a Friday week, and if I don't hear from that date, can I give you a call on Monday about two o'clock in the afternoon, right? That's called taking charge of your job search, right? And that's what we want to do. And depart with the same enthusiasm and interest on the job in the company as you entered. It's not one of, thank God it's over, <laughs> some relief. It's one of, it's been great visiting with you today. It has been, and it's the way you say it. Uh, repeat, I, I can't wait to get started. I look forward to the next step. Those kind of comments. Now, let me just talk about some general ones. We've got to end up this thing. General interviewing mistake that can lower your standing. All right. I always say this is the most important one. It's not demonstrating genuine enthusiasm or interest. So if your mindset is one of fear, anxiety, not sure, uh, that sort of thing, when you walk in, how can you show <laughs> enthusiasm or interest? It's pretty hard, but if you are genuinely excited about the position, the company, the interviewer, finding out more about the jobs, the expectations, the roles, uh, the things that you'll be doing, the, the achievements, the things, that, how you'll be measured and finding out all those things uh, it is ex exciting and energizing to you, then you will show that in the interview. So we, we need to be in that mindset. How do you get there? Well, it's practice, it's practice, right? Practice gives you that confidence. And that's what Mark and I are in business doing, free of charge to help you shorten your job search so that you can say, all right, I feel very confident. And now I can show that interest and enthusiasm in the interview itself. Answering the questions. If your view is just to go in and answer these questions and get out of Dodge, uh, that's gonna be pretty poor for being selected as a candidate and moving forward. A lot of people go in and say, you know, just please God help me answer these questions and get out of here. Well, that's one end of the spectrum. I just described the other end. So prepare our questions, prioritize them so we can integrate them during the interview. I wholeheartedly suggest we ask that opening question on the characteristics or how will I be measured? What achievements are you looking for me to accomplish in this role? So we can start selling to those things. It starts a conversation starter. You don't just find them out. We said, okay, which one would you like to talk about first? Now, one of the persons uh, mentioned, and she, she's not online now, says, you know, I'm an outstanding executive assistant looking to support executive management. And if we just change those words around a little bit with interest and excitement and say, I am an effective and efficient executive assistant maximizing support for executives to make impactful decisions. Now, I just changed the words around a little bit. I put it in their frame of reference. I'm saying, gee, I'm looking for a person who's energetic. I'm looking for a person who uh, does well in organizing and being effective and being efficient. So I'm describing myself. I'm telling you a little bit about who I am, you know, in that answer. 
So it's just a different way of thinking will generate these kinds of words. Speaking too quickly while trying to formulate a response. Oh, I'm telling you, there is some pressure on us to answer a question quickly or we think we're gonna just die right there on the spot. We've got to answer right away. No, you don't, no, you don't. In fact, that's totally wrong. I'm gonna tell you, usually I say, uh, consider this or consider that, and I'm just gonna tell you flat out. <laughs> that's wrong. Pause, pause. So pause and think before answering with a nice, clear, concise response. I'm thinking about the person in the picture that we asked a question to. So let me think about that for a moment. Took out a piece of paper, a pad, pencil, wrote down things, took about a minute, and then came back and gave us a nice, clear response. And every panelist said that was the best part of the interview, it was that person pausing, organizing their thoughts. It was not a, a simple answer to a question. It had some complexity to it. Stopped, took the time to put the thoughts together and did that. We were all very impressed with that. This was an executive level person. This is what we expect executive level people to do, all right? Some people walk in and say, I wanna show you that I'm quick on my feet and I can think rapidly, all right? Well, if you could do that and do that successfully, go for it. But at the same time, I think the inventors are much more impressed with people who pause and think and give a nice clear response. Speaking from our perspective only. So somebody was asked, you know, why do you wanna work here? And what did they say? They said, well, uh, why do you, well, because I think, of, you know, I really enjoy the environment. I, you've got great training. I like learning new things. Uh, I, like, I like a good work-life balance. And I believe you excel at that. And, and finally, you know, you're just a few minutes from the house. So my question is, uh, whose frame of reference are you in? Well, you're in your frame of reference. Is there anything wrong with Ensanza? Not necessarily wrong. That's your perspective. So if you want to give that, that could be great. But I'm going to tell you, the fact that you live a few minutes away from this job is not a part of the reason that I'm going to hire you. It doesn't mean anything to me. If I could add or maybe replace with what I really enjoy doing is I enjoy doing these kind of activities, producing these kind of results. For example, and I give an R and a star story of achieving something that's relevant to that position. So I'm driven by the results more than the activities. So you can be, you can mention your activities, but add your results to it or just give the results. Why do you want to work here? Because I like turning customers around, et cetera, doing, doing the things that are valued that you're hiring me for. Listen to what, and all the things we're telling you, listen to them as suggestions as the interviewer, how would they do? All right, listen to our words for implied negatives. Uh, I'm looking for managerial support, executive support kind of implies that we have not received it in the past. So I'll stop there. All right, well, that was our presentation. Uh, I know that uh, Walt is on the line. If you, there are a couple questions answered, I don't know if Walt will uh, uh, unmute his mic and answer the question. One of them was, can, you know, Walt, can you expand on having the right mindset? I'll be glad to, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, would you agree, first of all, <clears throat> that what you're thinking drives what you're going to say and how you're going to say it, what kind of actions you're going to take, how you would take those actions, all comes from your thinking. Thinking drives that. <clears throat> so with that understanding, uh, what do we do? What is our mindset when we go into the interview? If we have done the preparation, we have done the practice, and we begin to build that confidence and the, and the skills and understanding how we would answer Tell me about yourself and the clothes and the negative questions and the salary questions, the overqualified, all those things. I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much prepared for those. I'm, I'm ready for the negative questions. I know how to, how to approach the negative questions and saying it short and then giving a, a real positive ending to it. Now, now I feel good and I am anxious now to demonstrate my value, tell the stories, 
show them what I can do for them. I'm going to enjoy meeting this person. I'm looking forward to finding out what's going on, what's happening, and what are the areas where I can be of assistance and I can help them. When you're thinking that, your words change, your mannerisms change, you're smiling, you're energetic. You, you know, I don't have to say uh, lean forward. Uh, you lean forward when you have these type of things. That's a result. So that's my idea. So when you go in, what's your mindset? Now, there's a couple of TED Talks out there that say, uh, go to the restroom and adopt either Superman or Superwoman pose. All right. You put your hands on your hips, you look up. I am awesome. I, I, can, I can do a great job here. This is, this is really the best thing. I can't wait to, to get in and start talking to yourself like that. And you will begin to adopt that type of style. Your brain listens to you. Now, a problem that can be, if none of that's true, uh, you end up with psychosis and you're in, you, know, you, you, you go back and you just go bonker. So you can't lie to yourself. You have to be positive. But that, we're not talking about that here. Tell yourself positive things. I like to listen to types of music that energizes me and gets me toe tapping and gets me feeling good. Uh, I'll date myself with Ava and take a chance on me. I kind of like that song and I like the beat of it and the way they sing it. Everything like that's pretty cool. So those kinds of things help me get into that mindset and still be genuine and be authentic and be myself. Right. Uh, another question that came up and I'll let you answer it too, if you'd like, what's your opinion on sending thank you notes after the interview? Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, the general guideline, guideline is thank everyone who helps you. Everyone. Uh, this can be a simple thank you. Now, a lot of this is going to be by Zoom. Uh, we would say in the past, uh, when you're in the interview, you make sure you get everybody's uh, contact information and you can send a thank you note, that sort of thing. You can write it out, handwritten. And so be the interviewer. If you've interviewed people before, how many thank you notes have you gotten? And when you got one, what did you think about the person that sent it? So it actually moves you up a nice quantum step in this is the kind of person, this is the soft skill, this is the character of the person that I would like to work with that recognizes and sees this in other people. So one person I thought had a pretty good idea, took the thank you note stock, wrote out the note, took a picture of it and sent an email with the picture of that thank you note in it. That's a very different behavior, but thanking someone, Thanking them, giving them a compliment in the interview is the start of that. Then follow that up. And you don't just say, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Your note can't be just like anybody else's note. It has to be different. Thank you. I appreciate when you were talking about this thing. I think that's very important for this position. I'm glad you brought that up. As we have discussed, I'll, I'll anticipate hearing from you on this date. And if I don't, I'll be calling you on this date. So I'll go, I'll go in with that little action of taking charge of my job search in the thank you note. Brief. People don't like to read long things. I've seen people take a, a resume, fold the bottom page up so that only the top five lines are showing, and they make their decision off of that. You send a long note or a long item in an in a, uh, email, uh, people won't read that. So make it brief and make it short. Well, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, great information, great presentation. Thank you for uh, the last 13 episodes and all the time that you, you and Mark help uh, job seekers around here. Can I ask, uh, a, make a couple of comments right quick? Yeah, go ahead. All right, number one, uh, add target companies in your chat window. Uh, some of you uh, said some really nice things about what you do and that sort of thing. So add some companies. Uh, <clears throat> I can't remember who the person was. I have to go back to the chat window. Uh, you, you worked the Guinness World Records in the number of, of target companies. I think there was 21. One of the things you ended there was MUFD. So I went to, out to LinkedIn, looked up MUFD. There are nine hits on MUFD. And there were Tokyo, there were England, Japan. And I saw one that was uh, M MUFD analytics. So whatever you put in as your target company, Make it the same as what I would put in a search in LinkedIn to look for that company and look for people. So that's the second tip. And then I received an invite from one of the participants today 
I suggest in differentiation, always in a personal note. I met you here, I saw you here, whatever it might be. And then with a connection, send in a thank you. So those are kind of three things I noticed. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks very much, Walt. Uh, so thank you very, very much. All right, uh, Career DFW and Career USA, we're putting on training uh, four days a week. Hopefully you'll join us for upcoming episodes. Uh, tomorrow, uh, it's the fourth Thursday of the month, so we'll be talking about networking. Kurt Vondermatter is a retained search consultant, and he'll be talking about networking sort of from a recruiter standpoint and just from what he's seen over the years and how he networks. So uh, join us tomorrow at one o'clock for that presentation. This Friday at the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group, Mike Perry will be with us to talk about how to make networking strategies at work. Uh, I saw Mike a couple months ago present to a firm up, uh, another career group up in Pennsylvania, and I really liked his presentation. So uh, come join Mike on Friday morning at 9.30 for the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. Uh, for the months of November and December, we are going to have special guest speakers uh, so next Wednesday, Paul Walsh will be talking about behavioral interviewing. On November 10th, Gail uh, Bridgman will be talking about interviewing. Gail's with Lee Heck Harrison. On the 17th, Walt, uh, Mark McDonald will be with us to talk about the confident candidate, lessons from the pit crew. On December 1st, uh, Walt Glass will be with us to talk about distinctive interviewing. On December 8th, uh, the 10 Biggest Mistakes That People Make in Interviewing with Tony Bashera, And then we'll have a mystery guest on December 15th. Uh, there will be no sessions the week of Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. This session has been recorded. We'll be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel. On the Career USA YouTube channel, be sure to click on Playlist where you see that red arrow. And then down below, pick which list you want, resumes, interviewing, LinkedIn, et cetera. And then where you see that green arrow, click on view full playlist, and then up will come a list of all the topics and titles that we've talked about. The newest one should be on top. Uh, it'll take a couple hours for YouTube to load this video up, uh, so, but it will be up there later this afternoon. If you're not receiving emails about our workshops and you'd like to get on our mailing list, you're welcome to do so. Just send an email to careerusa, the plus sign subscribe at groups.io. Uh, you won't get spam, but what you will get is the topic of the day, the title of the day, and the Zoom link of the day. That way you'll be able to jump right in on the Zoom uh, message. So if you're not receiving our emails from any other source, you're welcome to uh, send us an email and join our mailing list. Please note, Career DFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All of our speakers are volunteers. I'm a volunteer. I've never gotten paid to do any of this over the last 13 years. I just do this to help the unemployed. Career DFW survives on donations. Please consider making one when you get your next job. So thank you very much for joining us today. Walt, once again, thanks for being with us. And uh, we'll see everybody hopefully later in the week. Thank you, Jeff.